<laughs> sure. So um, just to give you guys my background, uh, my background is in startup strategy and operations. Um, I believe Nikki met me several years ago through um, a company that he was advising for that he met um, that was part of 500 startups. So I've been part of 500 startups. It's one of the um, most well-renowned uh, accelerator programs in the world. It's up there with YC and Techstars. Um, so I've been a part of them since 2011. They invested in the first startup that I was a part of, um, and we were part of their alpha batch. So before they actually had, you know, an actual accelerator program, um, they gave us some money, gave us a few desks, um, and they said, if you have any questions, just email Dave and Christine. Um, and we were, we definitely asked a lot of questions. Um, that startup was since acquired um, by a mobile advertising company, um, one in the top three at the time of the acquisition, um, and it's still fairly large. Uh, and you know, we did some work there. Uh, it was an Indian company, so I had a lot of time during the day to, um, to, to myself. So I consulted with other companies. They were just like, "Oh my goodness, like you're part of 500. Oh, you had an acquisition. Oh, you're speaking at conferences about you know mobile advertising. You must know what you're talking about." I had no clue, um, but they offered to pay me so I would consult during the day. Um, and then through that, um, I joined this company called Greek Here. We do um, energy analytics. Um, and that's how Nikki met us because he was doing a whole bunch of really cool TEDx stuff um, over in um, Europe at the time. And, you know, he had, he had reached out to us. Um, is that how you met TAG is through, through Greek here or? Yes. Yep. That's exactly. Um, <laughs> that and we with some of the energy players in Austria and that's where we met. Yes. With TAG. Yes. And so, you know, Nikki has been absolutely instrumental to our, in our success. Um, he introduced us to a bunch of people um, we now work with. Um, and just, he has been able to keep us very focused on how we can continue innovating um, and how we can continue staying relevant um, during these times of change. Um, and then I think through that, just, you know, through the network that I've had through, you know, Nikki's groups, uh, he used to host a bunch of Silicon Valley inspiration tours um, and innovation tours, which I've been a part of. Um, you know, I, I think what everyone has been able to take away from these or what people have been able to take away from these tours has just, I, I believe, has impacted their growth sub substantially. At least it's impacted, you know, my growth. Um, and it was, I, w I would say it was part of uh, the inspiration to host these prediction groups that my friend and I did um, in that, you know, getting really smart people together, discussing um, events that are impacting them and trying to stay relevant um, in the future uh, is pretty much basically what that focus of the group is, right? Like the entire world was dealt with this incredible trauma all at the same time. And then it's being able to figure out, okay, well, what does that mean for us? How can we mitigate for it? you know, the impact of this trauma um, and what should we be doing, um, you know, to move forward. And it was really interesting. The way we ran the groups is we asked um, people beforehand to send over their top three predictions. Like, what are your top three predictions for, you know, the next, and, and we left the question super open, super open-ended just to see where people would go with it. Um, and some people had predictions for, you know, you know, this year and other people had predictions for like 20 years down the road and they were all across the board, anywhere from like the future of work to, you know, brand identity to, to personal identity to where, where the culture is going. Um, anywhere from like, you know, the death of the traditional institutional education um, all the way to, you know, the, the death of the large corporate brands. Um, it was really interesting to, uh, we, we talked about, you know, the rise and fall of Abrahamic religions to um, whether or not people who had, uh, you know, just enhanced body parts would be allowed to compete in the Olympics and whether or not they would actually overpower, you know, the, the typical human. So it was just really interesting where the conversations went. Um, we led the conversation. So we had everybody share their predictions with us privately. Uh, we match people um, on, in groups based on a number of different factors. Some of the groups, we didn't have an actual topic. It was just people who were interested in it's the same things or we thought would actually have a good conversation because in the beginning, we wanted to make sure that we knew um, 
we, we wanted to make sure that the conversations uh, and, and the personal dynamics within each group would, would be good. Um, so there was that. Uh, Another way we kind of matched people was just by being like, oh, this person would find this other person really interesting or would find what this person had to say really interesting or this topic really interesting. And we wanted to make sure there was at least one of those for every person in the group so that like when they stepped away from the group, they're like, oh my goodness, I got to talk to so-and-so or, or I got to learn about this other thing. Um, and then the other way we did groups was basically if everyone had a prediction around the same sort of topic. Um, so for example, we had one on the future of work. We had another one on the future of retail. We had another one on the future of brand identity. Um, so we had like very specific, the future of health. So we had very specific um, topic focus groups. Uh, and we didn't tell them beforehand that that was what the topic focus was. We just wanted to see if they kind of like gravitated towards it. Um, and it was really interesting because they did without us even having to mention it. Um, the way the groups were run is uh, we then, once we matched the groups, we had, we sent out an email um, kind of introducing the participants saying, hey, can you send to the group your top three predictions? Um, and we had everyone send their top three predictions. Um, and then during the first phone call, you know, we introduced what we're doing, the concept behind it. Um, we had everyone do like a, you know, three tweet introduction of themselves saying like, this is who I am. This is why, you know, I'm interested in this sort of thing. And these are, this was the one prediction of someone else that I was really interested in learning more about. Um, because the idea is that they've already read all the predictions. There's no need to kind of deep dive into all of them because there's no way we're going to get through the conversation. Um, in, in an hour if everyone's sharing their own predictions. So it's just like, these are, this is the prediction I'm most interested in learning about or talking more about. Um, we also just did something really quickly in the beginning where it's just like, these are our ground rules. Um, you know, don't be an asshole. Uh, you know, don't cut people off. It's, it's okay to have a difference of opinion, but try to back it up. We did ask people to um, back up any statistics um, or articles that they're throwing, throwing out there by just providing a link to the article. Um, but basically that was just the way we ran the groups. Um, once we collected what people wanted to talk about, we kind of just dove into them, right? We, we dove into, uh, those sorts of predictions. Um, and they were again, like really interesting. Some people talked about how, you know, coronavirus might actually, um, have people feeling more or looking more towards religion, um, you know, as kind of like a safety net. But then other people, other groups talked about how it was going to cause the demise of religion because religion is used as a place of gathering where people could get together and support one another. And without these um, places of worship, you know, where people are actually in a community together in person, that this just gives rise to more reasons to, to you know, step away from religion, right? Um, we talked about how... Uh, you know, there were like how brands were going to have to fight to stay relevant, like even like institutionalized education was going to have to fight to stay relevant. You know, a lot of people were moving away from having to be, you know, at a, at a university. Like what does that $200,000 education, what is that worth to you? How long will it take if people can't find jobs getting out of it? How long will it take for them to pay back that education? You know, when there are lots of programs such as, you know, the online coding boot camps where people can get the same sort of, I, I don't want to say experience, but the same sort of tutelage, right? Maybe in a different way, different factor, but might be more relevant to the type of work that they're, get, that they're getting. You know, what are those educational institutions who their, their entire value prop was, you know, we're actually in person giving you a liberal arts degree where you're actually meeting people networking um having this like cohesive comprehensive like, experience they're no longer able to do that what are they providing to them they're doing the same online courses as like a udemy is right um just being able to all these corporations who are talking about like having to work in an office um, oh, we need our workforce in the office. And now they're being forced to not work in an office anymore. But they're also seeing like, oh, wow, we are, you know, just as productive. Um, but our, you know, overhead costs are 40% less because we're not having to pay for office based lunches, um, all of these other things for everybody, right? Um, crazy insurance costs because you have property, because you own property or because you're leasing property. Um, 
what we can do more with this like limited workforce, you know, at this like discounted price. Oh, now we don't have to pay Silicon Valley prices. We can pay somebody in like Tulsa, Oklahoma and Lithuania and like Eastern Europe and, and, you know, the Philippines to do the same sort of work. Like, is this sustainable and how can we sustain it? So, you know, I think there are lots of things that are being accelerated. Um, you know, we talked about how a lot, a lot of large retail brands are going out of business are becoming bankrupt. You know, how do you as a brand when people aren't spending money, how do you stay relevant? Right. And it's just like, okay, not only are brands going to have to provide a lot of value, but they're also going to have to differentiate themselves from the other brands in the pack. And how do you differentiate yourself apart from the value that you're providing? Um, and so we talked about that. What I'd be really interested to learn from you guys is like, do you have any predictions? And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be COVID specific, but just, you know, yes, the, the future of campus education, I'd love to see this comment, um, is, uh, is a fascinating, is this still needed? Yeah, exactly. Like, is campus education still needed? There are lots of, you know, campuses, I believe Stanford, Brown University, I think maybe Harvard University, several school universities are not even going back to school this fall right? It's canceled indefinitely. Well, what does that mean? Um, you know, they, uh, luckily they have, or l luckily, you know, they have a lot of alumni, um, you know, funding. So they're going to be okay without one year of tuition. Um, but like, what, what does that mean, right? Like, what does that mean for, for, these, for these educational institutions? Like, where are they going? What's going to happen to them? Um, yeah, is it is it still and, and you know future and yes exactly future of relationships future of unemployment, you know just if you think about identity you know like from the identity and and the necessity of you know these educational institutions to corporations to even your self identity if you yourself um, are the breadwinner of your family and you can no longer provide that for them you know, who are you? If your job can easily be replaced or has been replaced and you're not an essential worker, what is your role? Like a lot of mid-management positions have been removed now. You know, a lot of companies will go through layoffs, but I think COVID has forced, you know, mass layoffs um, for a lot of white collar workers in general, right? Um, when you can easily be replaced um, or when you realize that you are no longer needed, both in the workforce, but then again at home, because like you can't not provide for your family the way that you used to, you know, what is your identity then? Like, so like, I think this, this whole, you know, this whole virus, this whole pandemic has brought all, up a lot of questions about like who we are, what we can provide, what value we provide both individually um, to our families, to ourselves, to our friends. Um, when you think about, you know, whether or not like you're even able to, you know, meet with your friends, like, are you part of that inner circle of friends that, you know, you're allowed to like meet with on, on a consistent basis? Like what value are you providing to your friends? You know, um, even things is like, what is the value of a hug? You know, is this person worth the hug? Or are you going to, you know, just fist you know, elbow bump them? Are you going to maintain six feet of distance? Are you not going to meet them at all? Because like you, you don't want to, you know, like they're, they're not worth that risk. Um, are you only going to do Zoom calls? Like, so it's like being able to like, on an individual level, I think we're, we're looking at like how we're viewing and valuing our relationships, even on a personal level. And then again, on a corporation level, you know, going in, like, are you necessary? Are you a necessary component to, to our business? Um, do we absolutely need you to continue to provide value um, in a meaningful sort of way? Um, and again, like a lot of positions have been, been canceled. So I would love to hear what you think, you know, COVID related or not, you know, what the future of the world is going to be um, and, and how people or companies or businesses or educational institutions can stay relevant and can stay actually top of mind and you know, in business. Um, so I, I, some, some of you are working on, on projects already. I'd love to hear more about them or how you think this is going to impact the world. And, and instead of texting here, I, I'd love to just have, you know, start a conversation about this because <laughs> I mean, these are great comments, um, but I'd love to actually have a discussion. Well, no, the, the last comment I threw in there was about, uh, you know, office space. And with so many people working from home and people talking about, 
it's not that offices go away altogether, but if corporations figure out that they only need half as much office space, you've now got a 20 year supply of empty buildings all over the world. And then what does that do to real estate markets and, and dynamics of being downtown and the amount of business that it was drawn? It could uh, kind of reshape a lot of cities potentially. Yeah, well, I, and, and oh, go ahead. I, I, I mean, just, just Mark at EY, uh, when I was there, we caught a quarter of a million people and we reduced the, uh, the space requirement by 30% instantly by having what was then hot desking. I'm guessing now it's probably 50%. And I'm working with major real estate developers on trying to work out what the hell to do. But the role of corporations, which has largely developed because of the physical grouping of people in a location. And you can apply that to a school, to a company with, a, with a offices, which are really there in order to support the communication between a group of people who you've corralled. As we are decorralling now, the role of the corporate is starting, well, actually, this grouping is a bit archaic, isn't it? Because virtual organizations are every bit as efficient, in fact, more efficient. And so we can move away from single salary people into having, into having what we previously used as a bit of an insult as freelance, uh, which is a which is a promotion if we call them consultants um, is is we're on a global scale so actually how the hell the US is going to be whole is going to be able to have an average salary which is 10 times that of India is under incredible threat um, yeah. and that brings with you the house prices and everything else upon which our economies have been built which on a planetary yeah. scale are grossly ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, here is, here is a thought because it's kind of a thing that happens more and more that there are conversations popping up about unused property space, unused real estate. And we're at the same time conversations about UBI, universal basic income. What would happen if it would add to the conversation of UBI, something like UBH, universal basic Yes. Something where everyone could have the right to live somewhere. Yeah. So, I mean, I was actually thinking about that. Like, with all this use, like, unused office space, like, what are they going to do with that, with those buildings? Um, and I think, again, this would be a, an amazing opportunity um, to do social good with it, right? So, we, we have, like, these huge homeless problem, homelessness problems in San Francisco, like, especially. You know, all that WeWork space that's not, be using, that, that, that's not being used or all of those like office spaces, the Salesforce building that's not being used, right? That could pro definitely provide housing. Um, like, are, are they going to use it for that? Likely not, but would that be a great thought um, and to figure out like what the economics of that could be? Um, I, I, I think it could be. Um, I mean, obviously you'd have to figure out a way to support that. Um, but, what are and the again, like, I people think, living on the street, right? What are the uh, people yeah. living on the street not having a home? And now they're having a home because everyone has access to a basic home. No one has to live yeah. on the street anymore. Yeah. So we, we, I think we'd have to figure out, like, what the, you know, financial implications of that would be um, for the government to be able to pay for those office buildings from um, the you know, the corporations that have been leasing or purchasing them. Um, but being able to figure that out, I think would be a great first step, right? Um, because what we're doing now is obviously not enough. But I think there are also, oh, oh no, 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 there's, there's no, no need to highlight my video. <laughs> Hold on, I want, I want, yeah, I want this, where I can see everybody's faces. Um, because I want everyone to actually participate. Um, is that okay, Nikki? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just, I really would love this to just be an open discussion about things that we can be doing um, or, or things that we're seeing, unless there's anything else that you want to, wanted me to talk about, Nikki, I'm happy oh, to yeah. be coming. dive in. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, very similar to like the whole autonomous vehicle thing, right? Like if people don't need parking, what can you do with all the extra space, right? Solve homelessness. Um, that's one of the reasons why I've been really bullish on, you know, autonomous vehicles. Um, besides the fact that I am an absolutely terrible driver. Um, like, you know, I really think that, you know, with 
with AV on the road, there are you know, less accidents, less traffic, um, and, and more space to actually be able to do things. So it's either retail space or, or space for housing. So it can either impact pricing, housing prices to you know, provide more supply, and then hopefully maybe in an abundance of supply so that you know, we can solve things like homelessness. Um, so like, and, and you know, on a sad note almost, you know, what with all the layoffs, I think there are going to be a lot more people desperate for housing and not being able to figure out how they're going to pay for it. So I think, you know, being able to provide affordable or free housing now or in the near future is going to be more, more important than ever. Yeah, but that's um, predicated around having a financial system which enables a significant amount of GDP to be passed through the government so that the government gets taxation upon which that premise works. If you start relaxing <laughs> each of those fixed items, you find that the matter of homelessness becomes irrelevant. And, uh, and the matter of global warming becomes much more important. And the fact that our economies are based upon consumerism, which is having people spending their time making stuff, which we then spend time throwing away and discarding, is, if you think about it, a ridiculous waste of human talent and human effort. Yeah. On the other hand, the systems which we have are predicated around that in terms of well, we've loosely sort of described, I'm, I'm not a socialist, but we've loosely described it as a capitalistic system whereby some people get the spoils and other people create the spoils. Um, and, and I think all of that is starting to get under question. Um, and the matter of offices really, frankly, is totally irrelevant. The, uh, a much more important thing is actually what our overall societal issues are because in the states it's a fucked society right um and uh, and in china it's a fucked society and so each of those is gonna is gonna have in the long term which might actually be short term it might be five ten years you know some major changes uh and i think a lot of people are just not seeing the writing on the wall yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a very fair point. Like we're we are really struggling, even within the U.S., to get on the same page about what are the issues we need to tackle as a nation. Um, and you know, if you take that one step further, you know, globally, you know, how is the U.S. participating um, with the other or collaborating with the other countries to to be able to solve these things? I think you know, in the past, we have been a lot more. Um, collaborative and open to working together. I think right now we're becoming a lot more isolationist, which is a little bit scary for me personally. Um, but then like, you know, you know, how do we get the countries to talk about and, and work together um, to make sure that we are making changes that impact the world on a global level and a scalable and, and positive way, right? So I think you bring up a very fair point. Mm -hmm. um, just being able to, you know, prioritize what those things are the U.S. is having a very difficult time even prioritizing internally what we need to be focusing on. Um, and then how, how do we, if we can't even focus on that, how do we play nicely with the rest of, with the, rest of the world? Um, if okay for you, and, I'd like to switch back to this concept of work from home. Um, yeah, sure. That, I mean, this is, feels like that could be fun and fun practice in this, in this group here, the, the unintended consequences of work from home. I'm thinking of war for talent. I'm just dropping things. War yeah. for talent. What doesn't happen when you think of war for talent and people don't have to have an immigration visa to the United States to be part of a company in Silicon Valley? Another thought is yeah. the diminish, diminishing of um, commuting, right? Um, there is this concept of the big city and the mega cities because, and the one reason for mega cities and large building is that vertical paths are more efficient than horizontal paths. And it's basically the number one reason why everyone's going to the city, it's way more efficient. But if we don't go to an office space anymore, if we don't commute anymore, we don't need that level of efficiency anymore. So will we go back to living in rural areas because it's way more livable in a rural area than in a city? Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the unintended consequences of work from home. What's your, what's your two cent mark? Start with you. What is my concept, uh, your opinion of working from home? unintended consequences of working from home, like no commute anymore? Or you know, I've, I've, I've been working from home for over a decade. And 
To me, the biggest shift was related to personal contact. That no matter how many Zoom sessions you have or how many phone calls or any other kind of communication method, there's still something very unique about sitting in front of a live person, sharing those moments. And I worry that this trend, which is now going to accelerate, I mean, there's a lot of benefits working from home, but I think this disconnection, I think Emily talked about, you know, this hug, just the concept of a hug, where you would go to work, you would shake hands, you would bump fists, you would hug people, whatever, you know, that relationship was. If all that's gone, I, I worry about that the most. But isn't it that if you only, so if you're, everyone you work with, you meet remotely on Zoom, isn't that freeing up time to meet in person only who you really want to see? <laughs> well, if it is more efficient, then you do have time to see other people. But part of, to me, part of the magic of working, because I always worked in office buildings when we were building computers, computer systems, uh, there was a camaraderie that was developed that I felt was very unique. So yes, I can play more, but I think something is lost in the work environment itself. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually, I want to echo that sentiment though, um, because I, I'm a huge proponent of working from home. I've been working from home since 2011. Um, and I think that companies should be, they, I think workers should be able to work remotely, but there's something to be said about being able to develop uh, that like that connection with your coworkers that you lose when everybody's working remotely or that you lose when you're not in an office space. I think the propensity for collaboration is lower. I think being able to be innovative together and just like throwing ideas off of one another is less likely to happen. The um, the ability to have like serendipitous moments at the water cooler is less likely to happen. Like you can try to create that same thing, you know, in, in a different way um, virtually. I don't think that's been solved for yet. And I don't know that it will be because I think there's something that the human, like, you know, that the literally touch interaction I think is, um, is, is going to be missing. You know, like we, we realize that when people meet coworkers for the first time, they work a lot better remotely afterwards or virtually afterwards once they've actually been in the same room with them, talked to them and interacted with them in, in a real life context. Um, so we're going to have to definitely solve for that if we want, we want to scale this in any big mean, meaningful way long term. How about making well, new friends? I, I, have, I, have, I have another question. So, well, well, yeah, uh, all, all this discussion sounds very nice. Sounds very nice and it's everything is nice and evolved and so on. But what I see, and you see it in America now, we saw it for a few days in Stuttgart. And my question is, maybe I'm too negative, I don't know. But what I see, if you have a lot of unemployed people and it's not over the crisis and we don't have solutions for these people, these people won't be peaceful. They won't go on the street, they won't throw stones in the shops, whatever you do, but maybe we have not a nice situation anymore. So it's, it's only what I see that's coming or, or I'm too negative for this prediction. I would love to respond to that. And of course I could be very wrong and I, I have a tendency to kind of just really go out there. I, I see what you're coming from, where you're coming from, where when people feel like their identity and their self-worth is being questioned and not being able to provide the way they want to, if there's any sort of insecurity um, and, you know, I, like, and restlessness, I, I could see um, acting out in a very negative way, right? Like if you look at the riots here in the US, there are plenty of riots here. Quite, quite honestly, I believe that, I, I understand why they're happening. I don't believe that they would be as bad if people were like in work and actually had other things and time and focus, things to focus on, right? Um, again, like I believe that racism is absolutely terrible, uh, but I think that there would probably be less attention on it if everyone were back at work. That being said, something that I really find interesting and something that I you know, brought up briefly in one of the other groups is, um, you know, as machines are taking over you know, work, so like autonomy, so if you think about factory workers being replaced by machines, um, even some surgeons are being replaced by robots, right? Um, and then like 
so so the basic so base level you know just automation is being taken over but then also like big like high level like ai like there are machines being created that can actually think like humans think faster than humans and think better than humans so like that big you know complex thinking is also going to be replaced by machines so what is going to be left for us to do right um so if like all the factory autonomous work is being done if all like the small like surgery and like very complex sort of like mechanical work is being done but also like the big thinking and the complex thinking is being done so what's left for us um and you know one of my friends had a really good idea he was like well that's why art is so important right because there's the only thing that humans can do is to you know create art or create or have that human one-to-one -one interaction um that like you can't necessarily get with a machine um th that that's hopefully what's going to happen is that people are going to become more creative and more artsy and more um and more connected like relationship wise because they're not going to have to do these menial tasks will it make us more stupid uh who knows right but will it make us like more more smart and and bright in other ways maybe right so it's just um it's really interesting if you you think about that but it gets kind of you know kind of out there <laughs> um i don't think it, it is like... out there i think i think um a lot of us are on that same wavelength at different uh at different stages um yeah. but i think i think we have i mean at the moment yeah, I, I just don't think we're any smarter than the people 2000 years ago who worked out how to get water Mm. Um, across uh, across 200 kilometers um, in southern Italy. I, I don't think we're any smarter than those people. Uh, I think, if anything, we've got collectively more stupid. <laughs> collectively more stupid. Because, I mean, we're allowing ourselves to have leaders who aren't able to really lead uh, whereas back in Roman times and you know, most of the history which we've got was when the world was very small, you know, so people really became local leaders. Um, I can't imagine many people, if you were in a little town of 500 people, you'd elect Trump, you know, but when you make it into, when you make it into, into millions, they do. Um, and I think it's because we are, we are, moving our decision making into some more morphal mass that we lose all relationship with the people who we are putting in charge. I, I Did you agree with you, Marcus. I think we've become a lot smarter. I think that we've, I mean, we're in the longest peace era of time and we, we have to deal with so much more information at the same time than 2000 years ago. And we are kind of juggling, kind of keeping the balls in the air, some better, some worse. And I think that we're also learning to adapt faster um, with everything that's changing on an exponential path. And 2000 years ago, it still was an exponential path, but it doubled from 0 0.00002 to 0 0.00004, which felt like a linear line. Um, with everything that's changing right now, I think we're smarter. We're probably also smarter to identify how we can differentiate and judge. And well, you think the individuals are smarter and i think yes and i also think that okay i don't yeah i i i mean smart what does smart actually mean right having more knowledge having more social intelligence having more emotional intelligence having more connections having more questions it's very broad i'm curious to ask actually i'm doing it here a stretch um chip conley he published this really interesting book about the elders in society mm. I'm curious to ask the elders in the room and answer if you feel addressed. What are your fears? I think... <laughs> <laughs> nope. Mark, okay. Margaret, what, what are your fears when you, when you look into five years from today and it's not going to be incremental change. It's going to... So what we've just seen here, we're in the... We're, we fit the knee on an exponential curve, right? We're in hyper acceleration. So everything we thought six months ago would happen in five years happened three months ago. And everything we think today is going to happen 10 years, we're going to happen in the next three to five years. 
and we're talking about how technology will take over um, efficiency and process things faster and how we will have achievements in medicine a lot faster than we think we have and on and forth. What are, what are your fears? What is, what is it when you think about it that you feel scared about? And I'm curious what Emily thinks about that emotion. emotion. And also, of course, to the youngest, Laura, what are your fears? What, um, think about it. Um, Mark, I'm curious. So my greatest fear? Um, we did a, a, a TEDx event at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. Absolutely amazing. Had 11 speakers on stage. I think nine of them were PhDs. It was a speaker who didn't make it on stage. That's a compli compli complicated story. But he was really into genomics. And we started talking about the, the miracles, the potential miracles that could happen through coming up with uh, diagnostics as well as treatments and whatnot. But then he got into the, I'll just summarize with the designer baby sort of scenario. And he predicted that a time will come in the very near future when everyone will, have, will start having babies, you know, bas basically in a Petri dish. Uh, so that you can screen for any possible genetic defect. And that it will, become, and it will become the norm and that it will even create this dystopian world where kids at school will, mm -hmm. will ask each other, well, were you a designer baby or not? And that the parents who didn't screen their kids will be looked upon as, you know, those kids will be inferior, that sort of thing. So I, I started going off into this dystopian world as I was talking to this guy. So I'm, I'm thinking with genetics, we're gonna see this incredible positive push, but I think that people's desires are gonna take it in a very negative direction also. Have you seen the movie Gattaca? It's no, my haven't. favorite movie of all time, and uh, it is exactly this scenario, like 100% exactly this. Um, and it's, it's, it's literally my favorite movie. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to go rent it now to, to find out. Yeah. Um, but what is, the, what is the name of the film? Gattaca, G-A-T-T-A-C-A. -A. Okay. Um, and it's about this dystopian society, the, it's, you know, Earth in a, you know, mm -hmm. a few years, pretty much, um, where there are designer babies versus non-designer babies. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's really good. Nikki, have you seen it? No, I just, oh, did it. I'm just oh, oh, sorry, it's just for, I didn't make it public. I do it again. So, but, but uh, I may be in the middle age here, so <laughs> I, mean, I actually don't have a fear, but the question what I see is, of course, with all the technology, with all the knowledge, we have to, the opportunity to make a paradise on earth, theoretically. Practical, what I see is, we are not able to solve simple social conflicts. For example, yesterday was a discussion on the on the on the TV about the equal income between man and woman. So we discuss it for I think 30 or 40 years. We already so stupid we haven't solved it yet. We discussed the question of climate change, I think said since 70 years we are not able to solve it. So I we have recommend theoretical, this you know theoretically we have all, all opportunities and all a lot of technologies. And on the other hand we are not able to take the mass of the people uh, in a, a positive way and for a positive thinking. Because what I see on the streets in, in, in US, in, in Germany now, and maybe in a few days in other countries, the people are frustrated. They don't have a view for their own future. And this, this frustration, they I won't go, I don't know, in conflicts, in, 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 I don't know, wars, whatever. I don't know. So Martin, data proves you're wrong here. And I can recommend the book of Hans Rosling called Factfulness, where it mm -hmm. proves that maybe in our society, but the societies were catching up to the underdevelopment and development countries, underdeveloped countries, they're catching up tremendously on mm -hmm. their, their, uh, their footprint and also the way people are treating each other. So the social development is catching up. We're, we're just ivory tower people, right? And our only worry is that we lose 
abandoned and where they live in abandoned and the only worry is that we have to share it with someone. Yeah. That's why we're treating each other so badly because we think that someone's taking away of what we have. Mm-hmm. We already have so much. Uh, we just have to look at the world in a different perspective. But the numbers prove you wrong. Um, and it's a really good book that, that explains that in the last mm-hmm. years, it's exponential positive growth in solving these problems. We're just still mm-hmm. a way behind where we're supposed to be. So I agree there. But that's kind of the power of doubling patterns that once you see something happening, once you hear weak signals, it's very it's gonna be very fast until you realize that the world is changing. Sorry, Emily. I, oh, no I, worries. I, I just I love it. listening. I love I love listening to this. Um I think one of my big fears is that, you know, we're not like we collectively as society are not taking a lot of these issues seriously. Um, we're blowing off the the negative consequences of our decisions or even our indecision to not make decisions about um, what we should be doing to mitigate for any of these impacts and that we are letting people who are not experts choose the course of action, right? And so I think it, it's, it's scary that, you know, there are lots of things like on the table that we need to address that aren't being addressed um, and that when they are being addressed, they're be- being addressed by the wrong people. Um, so that, I think that's really scary for me. Mm. Good point. Um, I, it looked like uh, Simon wanted to say something earlier. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Not not just now, but I think way earlier. I think you had had a few comments. Well, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> there, we're uh, jumping from topic to topic. Maybe just a couple of comments. So uh, it was really interesting when when someone talks about how important it is that a government gives a framework and and regulates things that you need to say, sorry, I'm not a socialist. And I think this is coming from the US where it's so polarizing that the moment where you call for actions by the government, you you have to be sorry for it. Um, um, And one more is maybe we could talk about the future of cities a little bit more. What I found really fascinating is um, the fight over public space in cities um, where people who live in the city want more space, tourists want more space, people who commute need and want more space. The same is true for, for, for um, hotels. And what I'm curious about is when I think about it, most public space is actually used for the cars that are parking there and are not used most of the time. Actually, I think it's 79% of the time they are not used. So if commuting plays a smaller role in the future, what does that mean? Um, how will cities change? Will there be gardens all along the, all, on all streets? And now I know this is what I wanted to mention because Nikki said that um, um, the quality of life is better outside of the c- cities in rural areas. I actually think this is wrong. It shouldn't be that way. Maybe it's true right now, but why don't we design the cities in a way where we say, hey, this is not only efficient, but a- also more as a, b- a better uh, quality of life in the city than outside? I don't know if Emily wants to answer the question. I think talking about the cities and the quality of life, the city is very good at finding a least common denominator. So the quality of life in the city is a lot better for poor levels because they can raise the water, elevate the ships. Um, but if you, you have to, if you have the choice, like if you have the choice to live in a house with garden and you have your own car and you have your neat environment, it's way more affordable. So the cost of living are are lower than in the city. So it's kind of this level of middle class. I mean, I'm talking about the top class because top class can go anywhere they want, but the, the, the middle class level. So the lower classes pull up, the middle class is kind of, um, they have lower um, living standards in the city than in the rural areas. But yes, you're right. We can design the city in a different way. But also, looking at the cities that already exist and what will happen in 10 years, let's just, let's imagine that um, not, not 70 to 90% of the streets are actually turned into gardens and, and playgrounds. Um, 
and everything that you actually need as a person living there it may, might turn into this kind of quality you were ex uh, you were just talking about i'm just saying like when covid break when the covid breakout was obvious um, a lot of my friends like three weeks before that happened went in in um, in isolation in self isolation and then they, they booked an airbnb two hours away from san francisco so they left the city and mm -hmm. found their they said, okay, this is going to be the, my home for, I don't know un, how long, but I feel a lot safer and more comfortable out of the city um, in, an, in a time of uncertainty with the pandemic. Yeah, we actually, it was really interesting. My friend and I were thinking about um, just creating like these like little COVID free communities. Um, and we we're trying to figure out, okay, well, if this is going to be indefinite, you know, it makes a lot more sense to maybe get a place outside um, somewhere maybe like two, three hours away from San Francisco, but a community, because like we want to f feel the, fight the feeling of isolationism that we were feeling, just like being not able to see or feel or touch people. And so it's like, okay, well, how can we solve for that problem? Um, so sorry, we just got a puppy a couple of days ago. Um, we did not realize we were getting a puppy before this like, road trip. And so I had to like sit down on the ground and try to make sure that she, she doesn't go crazy. So if you hear her barking, it's, it's her. Um, but uh, yeah, so like just we, we wanted to create this community where people didn't feel isolated from the rest of the world, where there could still be some interaction. And then it's like, okay, well, what is this like? you know, I don't want to say utopian community, but what is like this better community, right? Like it has to have access to like trails and nature, right? It has to be close enough to a supermarket where we can get food, but like not necessarily, um, but not necessarily like right next to it because we don't want to be exposed to other people, right? So like, what are these things that we need? Um, granted, like we created it for like, you know, young adults. I mean, anyone really, but definitely people, more pe more for people who didn't have like entire families, but then we're thinking, oh, do we want to create these communities for people with families that they can co go to, like these safe communities, right? Like, and what is a safe community? How do you decide whether or not somebody can be let in? Um, but like, yeah, so it's, it's a little bit off from what you were talking about in terms of just like, what do you do with all this extra space that create parks, like you can, you know, create a better, better place for other people what, once the people who, um, have the means to be able to move and live where they actually want to go. Like, what can you do with that space? But again, I think it comes down to priorities. Like, what are we focusing our attentions on? Like, what are we focusing our attention on? Um, and I think we don't know, right? Like, the U.S. is so divided on, like, where we should be spending our money and our effort and our resources that by saying, like, oh, like, once all the rich people move out of the you know, the cities, now we can make the cities a lot better. Again, I'm like, oh, that would be a great opportunity to change like, you know, a lot of these unused spaces into like, you know, homes, right? But again, like, you know, there are other things that we need to consider, like how bad is climate change? Like I work for a company whose goal is to like fight climate change by making energy utilities more efficient. Like I'm consulting for a company who is fighting fast fashion, is, is trying to make the world more sustainable by fighting fast fashion and like, you know, getting, making drifted, the thrifted clothing experience, uh, you know, more accessible and sexy, right? So like, we're trying to fight, you know, climate change in so many different ways. But is that what the government is focusing on? No, like the US just like backed out of the Paris climate agreement. You know, so like, so, so making sure that like, we're all on the same page, and that we're all prioritizing our resources effectively and efficiently, like we can't even agree on that. So I think the first step is to figure out, okay, what are the problems that we need to face? Like, what are the ones that we can actually have the biggest impact on with the smallest amount of resources and the fastest amount of time? You know, it goes back to like those ICE examples, like impact, confidence, um, you know, expense and expectation, right? Like what are, like, what do you think you can accomplish with the, like the biggest impact with the smallest amount of resources in the quickest amount of time? Um, but like we, again, like, I think we need to be able to figure that out. Um, before we can talk about like, okay, well, you know, this is like, let's build parks. Like, <laughs> um, I, I, again, I love the idea of it, but I think it's just, we need to prioritize and we need to get the right people prioritizing, um, and providing solutions and then actually implement the solutions. Cause right now it's like all, all talk and it's not even talk cause a lot of people aren't even talking about it. Like they have their heads in the sands. And I think that that's why like this, this group was so great for me because it made me, it reinstilled faith in humanity. Even if people had some dark, you know, 
some some dark predictions it was great because people are actually thinking about it because like thinking about it is the first step it's not the only step you know you need to take more steps after that but like getting people thinking about it knowing that i'm not crazy for having <laughs> these fears or thinking these things knowing that other people are actually feeling the same thing or maybe different things but like you know thinking about similar things so that we can initiate that change so we can be the catalyst to to those changes that need to be made um, I think was just really, really thrilling. And I hope that people actually take action. And um, and I hope you guys take action too. And, and it sounds like you guys are working on really cool things. Like at Simon, I'd love to talk to you. Laura, I'd love to talk to like all of you. I just, I'd love to talk to you, you know, separately outside of this, um, just to learn more about what you're doing and, and ways that, you know, you can be helping. Emily, thank you so much. I think that was the best possible closing of the week. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and all the thoughts into the conversation. I, I loved it. I'm going to connect you all. Um, take it from here. Keep on, keep on chatting. Keep on talking about the future. Um, yeah. Join forces, join brains um, to create it, to design it, to shape it. Yeah, please reach out to me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a beautiful rest of your Friday and enjoy the time with your pups. <laughs> Thank you. See ya. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. That's great.